In this video, we're going to discuss binary covalent naming. So we've talked about ionic naming, where if you have an ion like sodium and chloride, they will pair together to make sodium chloride. The idea with ions was you could have a ton of them. Maybe you only have a few. Maybe you have a much larger crystal. But they just kept piling on top of each other. So you never talked about how many total sodium chlorides there were in your particular salt crystal or block of salt. You just talked about the ratio. There was one sodium for every one chloride. And so ionic was the lowest whole number ratios. This is not true for covalent molecules. If you have something like methane, CH4, it is a carbon with four hydrogens around it. And while we'll discuss structures in Vesper and Lewis structures, this is the, what it would look like visually. And so it's got four hydrogens around it, and if you have another methane, they may be next to each other, but they don't have any direct interaction, not the way sodium and chloride does. So this chloride is actually interacting with multiple sodiums around it in the salt crystal. It is attracted to all of those positives. Ionic bonding was just pulling up next to an opposite charge. If you have a pile of magnets on your table, they're all kind of stuck to one another. But a covalent molecule might sit next to another molecule, but the atoms it shares with are the only things it's actually connected to. The result of this was if you were to, say, dissolve the ionic compound and come back a little bit later, your positive ions were now in other spots. They had changed which negative they were associated with. But if you were to highlight the hydrogens on one of your methanes and come back an hour later, they're still on the same carbon. They don't change. They don't shift around. Additionally, well, with sodium chloride, if I just add more sodium chloride, the crystal just gets bigger. If I actually add more hydrogens and carbons, my formula becomes quite significantly different. Now, I'm not saying add another molecule. I'm saying, what if you have C2H4 versus C3H6 versus C4H8? For the ionics, saying Na2Cl2 was exactly the same as saying the original. Saying Na3Cl3, well, they're all one-to-one -one ratios. For ionics, we only give the lowest whole number ratio. Covalence, though, because how they connect to one another, their ratios cannot be what we report. We must give the actual number of each atom in individual molecules. For example, here, a C2H4 will look like this. It'll have two carbons that share two bonds with each other, and each carbon will have two hydrogens. But if I have C3H6, I can't just put more carbons and hydrogens nearby the way I could put more ions nearby. The molecule significantly alters. I still have my carbons double bonded, but what will happen now is one of those goes down to a carbon with three hydrogens. Well, here's a carbon that doesn't have a double bond. That's completely different in its behavior than carbons from before. If I go down to C4H8, this can change even more. In this case, I now have multiple carbons with single bonds to other carbons, and one with a double bond, and well, we didn't see that at all. Additionally, you can have rings, where each carbon has two hydrogens. There's no double bond in there at all. How we put together those covalents fundamentally changes how they behave. And the number of the atoms are critical to being able to achieve those different arrangements. And so covalent naming actually requires quite a different set of rules than ionic. If you want to dive into the depths of organic naming, you'll do that in 131. In fact, you'll spend about a half the quarter learning just the basics. We'll do the most simple version here. We're going to look at binary covalent. What binary covalent represents is two different types of atoms. So binary for two, these are things like 
BCL3, SF4, OF2, PCL3, PCL5. Situations like this, where you have two different elements making up a molecule. And so the way we name these are in two parts. The first part is the name of first element. And the ending part is the second element as if it were an anion. Now it isn't an anion. The whole idea of covalent bonding is that they're sharing electrons, but we name it like it would be. And then this middle bit, technically out in front here, is the number. So up here, my first element is boron. And so the name for this is boron. And then I have Cl. Well, if chlorine were an anion, it would be chloride. Now it's not, but that's just how they name it, the second element gets the ending as if it was a monoatomic anion. And then, well, we said the number matters. Having three chlorines is very specifically this molecule, not four, three. This isn't B2Cl6, this is just BCl3. And so I need to tell you that there are three chlorides, and I do it with tri. There's a numbering system, there's mono for one, Di for two, tri for three, tetra for four, penta for five, and hexa for six. You can go above that, but for our purposes, we won't go past six. Technically, this would be monoboron trichloride, but we don't put the mono in almost ever. Um, it's only there in a couple random molecules. The idea is if we named the element, there must be at least one. Like we don't have zero sulfur, zero fluorine. If we name boron, there must be at least one boron. So we leave the mono off most of the time. SF4. Well, I have a sulfur first, so it is sulfur. And then F4. Well, there's four of them, so it's tetra. And then fluorine, if it were a anion, would be fluoride. Sulfur tetrafluoride. It's right here with the ox OF2. Oxygen is our first element. And then F2. Well, it's going to be difluoride. Di for two. And again, it's fluorine, named as if it were an anion, so fluoride. PCL3. Well, P is phosphorus, so phosphorus trichloride. And then PCL5. Well, this is another molecule you can make with phosphorus and chlorine, and this is phosphorus pentachloride. Now, you can absolutely have things like N2O4 or NO. I'll try to name these two. Well, I have two nitrogen. I still have to tell you how many I have. So this is a di nitrogen and then four tetroxide. Now, you might think it should be tetraoxide, and you are correct, but English doesn't like too long vowels, and so it often loses the A and becomes tetroxide instead of tetraoxide. But depending on what language and where you're from, you may still pronounce the A. And O, on the other hand, is just nitrogen. And we, again, we don't say mono if we don't need to, so just nitrogen oxide. Technically, mononitrogen monoxide, but we don't use the monos. This leads to some fun ones. Try going backwards. What is dihydrogen monoxide? Think about that for a second. Well, dihydrogen, there must be two hydrogens at the front, and oxide, monoxide is one. 
one oxygen. This is water. This is the most over the top technically correct name for water. Um, in fact, way back in the early days of the internet, there was a bunch of websites devoted to places where people had tricked people into being wary of the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide. News stories about town councils who had banned its use within its borders because it was used in styrofoam synthesis, uh, scientific papers on the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide. Did you know that every year dozens of people in the U.S. die from dihydrogen monoxide inhalation? Or that traces of it have been found in every reservoir in the country? It was a fun thing back in the early days. Now, now you can look it up. There's Wikipedia articles for it. This is the idea of binary covalent naming. A few examples we're used to are things like CO2, so carbon dioxide, but also CO is one of our exceptions. We call it carbon monoxide. It's one of the rare times we actually use the mono, and it's mostly so the general public can differentiate the two. Your car is supposed to produce carbon dioxide, but if it's not firing correctly, it makes some carbon monoxide. This is why you're not supposed to work on vehicles that are running inside a closed garage. Um, they produce carbon monoxide, and it's a toxic inhalation gas. It's also a big factor in sickness after escaping from a fire. There's a lot of carbon monoxide in the air during a home fire. Big takeaways for binary covalent naming. You need the name of your first element, and you name your second element as if it were an anion. And you use these specifiers to tell how many. Word of warning, this is only for binary covalence. Do not try things like monosodium, monochloride. This is very incorrect. Ionic compounds do not tell you how many of the ion you have in the name. Binary covalents do. That's actually part of how you can tell that it is a covalent molecule. If you see a di, a tri, a tetra, it is telling you it is a covalent molecule. They are never seen in ionic compounds. So make sure you don't accidentally include them. I think the second part tends to confuse a lot of students. They occasionally see chloride with a prefix, but that is only when it is in a binary covalent. It will never be in an ionic compound. So a little word of warning on where binary covalents can get a little confusing with ionics.